This video is tackling mercury. And I often get the question of the mercury one ion. Why is the mercury one ion a dimer? That is Hg22 plus and not Hg plus. Well, the explanation for this is a little bit complicated. We're going to use a couple topics uh, but that I've tried to simplify and make into general chemistry language. For those of you theoretical chemists, grad students, physical chemists, etc., this video is not for you. I'm just trying to make a way to explain what's going on with mercury in this. And kind of to get there, I have to go through why mercury is a liquid. It'll, it'll be helpful in our discussion. Where we're going to need to use a little bit of MO theory, some electron configurations, some Heisenberg and Zerdy principle, etc. Over here, a little piece of the periodic table. And mercury is one of those unique metals that is a liquid at room temperature. We don't see anything else like that. We see things like gallium has a pretty low melting point, um, but it's not like mercury at room temperature. So what's going on? Well, mercury, I've drawn a couple of the electron configurations here. Mercury has this 2s electrons. And the same would be true for cadmium and zinc. So what happens as you get those, uh, the nuclei larger and larger, there's a higher and higher uh, nuclear charge, meaning there's a ton of protons in mercury. Because there's so many protons, it's going to hold these electrons super tight to it. Okay? So because of that, and for the reason that uh, mercury has kind of a normal gas configuration in that all its shells are filled, making it relatively stable. For those reasons, uh, mercury tends to hold these two electrons, similar to cadmium and zinc, pretty close to it. And as a result, it doesn't bind very well uh, with other, with itself. It tends to just stay by itself as lone mercury and thus keeps it in the liquid state. Now, there's been a paper, I think in about 2013, that did some analysis here. And just based on those effects, we expect lower melting points for these three elements. Again, they're pretty massive, mercury being the most massive. And they have filled shells. So the mercury, the cadmium, the zinc would have filled shells. It'd be a little bit mimicking that of an inert gas or a noble gas. So it turns out for mercury specifically, there's these relativistic effects that come into play. So if I draw, let's say this is the nucleus of mercury, and we have these two electrons kind of flying around it. Mercury is massive enough that uh, these electrons, because they're close to the nucleus, these 6s2 electrons, have to go in around the nucleus pretty fast, if we can imagine them orbiting the nucleus. They have to go really fast around the nucleus uh, to not be pulled into the nucleus because of the, all the protons here, or all the positive charge because of its high nuclear charge. So it has to go fast enough to not swirl into the center and thus be absorbed. So what happens is it goes so fast, this velocity approaches that of the speed of light or becomes somewhat appreciable. And as you may or may not know from relativity and Einstein, etc., the faster something goes, the more massive it becomes. Because these are becoming more massive because of the relativity effects, the momentum is going up because momentum is a function of the mass. As a result, the distance from the nucleus goes down. Uh, and so it gets drawn in even closer to the nucleus than we would expect without the relativistic effects. And when the paper did relativistic calculations on mercury in a theoretical model, they found out they could actually predict, uh, they could actually calculate theoretically uh, the melting point of mercury, which fits with our experimental value. As a result, they confirmed the relativistic effects of mercury, uh, which people had thought for a long time. And what it kind of boils down to is the 6s electrons, 6s2 electrons on mercury are super close to that nucleus. It boils down to having weak metal bonds. Uh, other metals, because they don't have the electrons so tied up into the nucleus, 
uh, they, if you take what's called electron C model, they have these electrons like copper kind of free flowing out there and it makes them fairly conductive and able to make bulk structures very easily in the solid form. Because mercury can't do that, it tends to stay in the liquid form a lot longer. Oh, you may wonder about the binding along a row. Why do the thallium and gold kind of do exhibit similar properties as mercury? Most importantly, this, uh, they both have one electron, whether the 6s1 for gold or the 6p1 for thallium, that is also hanging out as a lone element and ready to bind. And as a result, even though they have relatively similar nuclei and similar uh, nuclear charge as the mercury, because they have these lone elements, it, uh, lone electrons here in the 6s1 and the 6p1, it makes it easier for those to bind and then they can more easily form bonds with itself and thus form a bulk solid structure. Why would mercury be a dimer? Well, I'm going to draw something that looks a little bit like an MO diagram, and you'll see how this works. Let's say we have a mercury here, 6s, and binding with another 6s orbital for mercury. Okay? As you know, and this is just approximation, just to kind of see how this works. I'm not including all the orbitals. Now, mercury, you know, has two electrons in the 6s, uh, and it can form a sigma or a sigma star antibonding. Well, if we have two and two electrons, that would go one, two, three, and four. Again, we see why mercury doesn't want to bind with itself in the neutral state because it's not favorable energetically because it has these electrons up here in that orbital. Let's take in contrast to this gold. Well, those two electrons will both be down in the sigma. And thus that makes gold a lot more likely to want to bind with itself because this is energetically favorable. We don't have any electrons in the uh, sigma star or the antibonding orbital. So it makes a lot more favorable. Now, hopefully it makes a lot more sense why Hg plus will want to form a dimer. Because Hg plus, they both have one electron in the 6s orbital. Uh, they're, they're missing one from the neutral mercury. And so each one of those electrons will go down here into the sigma, and not one in the sigma, none in the sigma star orbital. So it makes this Hg plus favorable when it binds to itself, because it'll put both electrons in the sigma orbital. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of explanation of why mercury does this. Uh, again, this is just an approximate, trying to put it in general hand language and get a little bit of an idea about this dimer and what mercury is like in general. Now, some people wonder and have talked about, well, what about the element down here, number 112? When people do more calculations on this, it'd be interesting to see if theoretically at least, does this element also exhibit some of the similar properties of mercury because it also will have a massive nucleus, massive enough to allow relativistic effects to come into play because as, we, as I mentioned before, the cadmium and zinc don't have that. So uh, that's an interesting project for the future.